Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Fields of Innovation, part of AURI Connects monthly event series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. I'm Dan Scogan, AURI's Director of Industry and Government Relations and your host for Fields of Innovation. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in Minnesota. Fields of Innovation, with sponsorship from Bremer Bank, is focused on bringing together Minnesota's regional ag and food value chains to build capacity and successfully commercialize new crops and accelerate the commercialization of new crops and livestock opportunities, including new traits for existing crops. Events focused on uh, connecting innovation and market development with value chain partners. Fields of Innovation aims to build a strong ecosystem in Minnesota and border states that will provide egg producers and value chain partners with new market opportunities. Now remember that this event is being recorded and will be archived and can be found at auri.org. Also remember, participants are muted, but you can ask questions through our Q&A portal on your screen. Today, we are here to learn more about life cycle assessment and, uh, can and how it can uh, define a framework for emissions reduction and guide businesses along the agriculture value chain to lower carbon intensity scores with climate smart innovations. An LCA is a holistic evaluation of the cumulative environmental impacts of each stage of a system and may be used to analyze products, processing and transportation, activities, organizations, and even cities, sometimes with surprising or counterintuitive results. We will start our discussion today with two presentations. First, Dr. Joel Tollickson, Renewable Energy and Sustainability Science Scientist at West Central Research and Outreach Center. Dr. Tollickson's research focuses on using the most up-to-date science with new technologies or in new applications to solve energy and environmental challenges facing rural communities. Employed at the West Central Research and Outreach Center, Tollickson has taken active roles in research on renewable energy production, biomass supply chains, and life cycle assessment of energy and farming systems. And we'll also hear from AURI's own Jason Robinson. He is the Business Development Director for Food at the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. In this role, Jason works with food clients to develop their businesses to further the value-added development of Minnesota's agricultural products. Jason brings a wealth of knowledge and experience into the end-to-end -end new product development process, including product recipe and process development, product stability and shelf life management, cost reduction strategies, consumer-focused concepts and idea development, process scale-up and commercialization experiment design, sensory evaluation, quality system evaluation and management, label development, and food safety compliance. Then we will move to a discussion with Carrie Pearson, the product sustainability lead at Cargill, and Kate Berry, sustainable packaging manager at Chain Chainalytics, and more about those guests later. So let's get started. Dr. Joel Wallace, welcome to Fields of Innovation. Thank you, Dan. It's uh, very good to be here. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about life cycle assessment. But getting into LCA, I think Dan set it up really nicely, talking a little bit about um, being a holistic method for uh, analyzing systems. So kind of going a little bit further into that, um, LCA is really used mostly for uh, analyzing the uh, environmental impacts of production systems. And depending on the LCA, it, it's very holistic going from um, the extraction of resources all the way through production and end of life. Now, the nice thing about LCA is that it can examine multiple environmental issues. So you can look at things like fossil energy, greenhouse gases, but you can get very specific and look at some really detailed topics, um, health impacts, specific health impacts, um, toxicities in certain areas. And the two main uses that I see uh, for LCA are really to uh, well, for, there is a third thing, and that's just to ge get a general sense of a system and the environmental impacts that that system is having on a particular environment. Um, but really, one of the things that I think is nice about LCA is that it allows you to look at environmental hotspots, looking at a system to figure out where can we solve problems. 
The other thing I really like about LCA is the ability to compare multiple options. So if you're developing a production system, um, you can choose different options. And one of the one of the key things in agriculture um, is looking at different alternatives in diet formulation. And so, for example, in a dairy system, you might look at diet A, which is a heavy corn silage diet versus diet B, which is alfalfa. So it allows you to, to make some of these comparisons in um, kind of a methodical way. And just to go a little bit more into the background of LCA, uh, LCA is really an accounting methodology, and it focuses on non-economic issues. So we can gather a lot of data and use that data to look at environmental impacts and some of the other impacts a system might have. Now, historically, businesses have used LCA uh, for resource availability, and this is in the, I, I don't want to say distant past, but you know, starting in the 70s and 80s, people were looking at um, resource use in their production chains. And so this is kind of the roots of LCA, but as it has modernized, um, we began to attempt to standardize the system. So you can compare or better compare results from one LCA to the next. Um, and so there's ISO standards, the EU is starting to set up specific standards for different sectors uh, so that the LCA is uh, can be compared a little bit. So the general methodology of a life cycle um, assessment is first of all, to set up a specific goal of your assessment. Often that's asking an important question about the system you wanna analyze. Um, and I, I have an example here next, but then the data gathering process starts. And that's really often the biggest challenge in LCA work is getting data on different systems, especially in agriculture. Then once you have all that data, then you can begin to model how that data is gonna to fit together. You develop a, a input output system, uh, depending on the model, you can, you can develop it uh, in several different ways, but I'll show an example of how a lot of the models are set up later. Uh, the next step is to sum all those inputs and outputs then convert some of the, the changes you see into standardized impact. So if you develop this big system, you figure out that you have one kilogram of methane being released in your system, that's equivalent to about 25 kilograms of CO2. And then at the end of the process, you can present these the total amounts of whatever changes have happened as an impact. So in the case of say alfalfa or so, I guess they use a soybean meal here, uh, we can look at the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of soybean meal. So all the things like methane and direct CO2 released would be added up to come up with the greenhouse gas emission for that system. This is kind of, that was a general overview of LCA, but really ag LCA ha has its own quirks. Um, I think that is the best way to put it maybe. Um, but in general, Agriculture deals with biological systems, and they're very different than if you go into a factory that's making staplers, it doesn't matter what the temperature is, it doesn't matter what the weather is, but when you start dealing with biological systems, there are um, complex interactions that you have to think about. And in agriculture, you're talking often about soil type, moisture, temperature, things like that, that will impact how fast something happens or the chemical reactions happening in that system. Now, one of the other things about agriculture is there's often some allocation of impacts. So if you find out there's a certain amount of greenhouse gas being produced, but it's going into two different products, you have to figure out how to divide that impact between the two products. The other thing is, even though a lot of LCA effort is talks about holistic methods, looking at a complete circular system. In ag LCA, we tend to find things are uh, more cradle to gate. Uh, in my case, I work mostly cradle to farm gate. So at the end of production, then the products that are produced go into the next part of the supply chain. So to give a quick overview or an example, this is a project. Um, this is the the beginning 
of the project. We, I set this slide up as um, how to go about doing an LCA on alfalfa production. And so the question I had was, what are the environmental impacts in terms of greenhouse gases, fossil energy, and water use for alfalfa production? Looking at the system, I first started out with, okay, what's happening on the farm? Then what's happening behind the farm? So the inputs that are coming into the farm, then the inputs that are that getting the background information on these inputs. So for example, for each uh, gallon of fuel, it might be five uh, pounds of carbon emitted for that gallon of fuel. And by tracking information through the system, you can come up with uh, a carbon footprint or a greenhouse gas footprint at the end. And so, um, at the end of the study, it was roughly 320 pounds of CO2 per ton of alfalfa. So actually, that was the, the kind of the pre-work slide. But when we got to the actual uh, study, started to do this work in the modeling software that I used. And so here's an example of the kind of thing that we were looking at. So for every ton of alfalfa we produced, um, we were adding in lime, sulfur, there were soil emissions with the system, um, a lot of tillage, seeding, all the things like that that we had to add in. So the big part of our work was this data collection to find these numbers. And as I said, LCA is really an accounting system. And so you have to find a lot of data to make everything work and make your models work. So in this system, this was just a small snapshot of some of the work we were doing. But in this, in the whole complete system, uh, the team I worked with, we just focused on this top level alfalfa production system right here. And then in the background, our software was looking at all the different things that were going into one ton of alfalfa. So this one ton of alfalfa up here at the top is um, based on all the things that come through this system and at the bottom, you see some of the resources are going in there. So I can track how one uh, ton of alfalfa might use, say, 30 gallons of crude oil. That's the, the advantage of knowing this information is you can use some of these, these models and these studies to find a lot of different pieces of information about your system. So after doing all this kind of work, then you can start to look at the results and doing some interpretation. And so here's a figure that showed the final results from this study. When we went through the whole system, what we found was that um, there was too much variation in the Midwest to just focus on one area, uh, or the Midwest is one area for an LCA analysis. And so we divided it up and found regionally there were quite a few differences in uh, alfalfa production that resulted in different impacts for the system. So you can see, for example, Nebraska and Wisconsin have quite different impacts. Well, in Nebraska, they were using quite a bit of irrigation water, which required either coal energy or diesel fuel for generators. And in uh, Wisconsin, they were using lime, and that lime actually emits CO2, and so it was making a much higher uh, footprint, greenhouse gas footprint for alfalfa produced in Wisconsin. Uh, and I don't think we would have expected that, but that's some of the, the initial findings from this work. Now, the nice thing about LCA is once you find some of these hot spots, some of the things that are happening, then you can begin to reduce those impacts. Um, and just in general, what we found was that alfalfa already has fairly low impacts. Um, it it's, doesn't use much tillage on a, on a yield basis. And so there really isn't a lot of fuel use. Uh, most of the fuel use there is related to harvest. The other thing that we saw was that there are a lot of soil emissions, whether it's uh, uh, nitrous oxides or CO2, but we really can't change those. Those are part of the bio biological processes of alfalfa production. So you just can't change them. So in looking at how we could change alfalfa production, um, one of the things that we identified was that if we have the same system but can figure out how to get higher yields, that will reduce the per unit 
impacts that that alfalfa production has. And of course, the other thing we noticed is that lime and irrigation, both of those things really spiked the carbon footprint of the alfalfa produced. So those are two areas that we felt, you know, if we were going to go forward, trying to reduce impacts that should be examined. So that's just sort of a, an overview and an example of LCA. I've got a couple more examples I'm just going to run through real quick here. Um, another project we've looked at is organic chamomile, uh, camelina meal for swine feed. There's a, a real bottleneck in uh, soybean meal for protein in the organic system. Uh, not enough soybean, organic soybeans are being produced. So we looked at another potential crop, camelina, and we uh, went through the whole system all the way from planting the camelina to feeding the uh, camelina meal out uh, in pork. And what we found was that it actually had a, a worse performance than did uh, the soybean system. And what it all came back to was that the camelina meal or the camelina grain yield was just too low to compete uh, environmentally with the soybeans. So it doesn't really make sense in the system. That said, the camelina meal fed very well in the, in the swine feeding trials and it looked good, but we just couldn't get high enough yields to make it work. Now, another project that we've been looking at is corn production. And how do we reduce fossil energy and greenhouse gas emissions in corn production? So uh, one of our early studies was looking at all our agronomic systems at our research farm. And the pie chart here shows what we found in corn production, where energy was being used. One of the biggest things was drying. We were using a lot of natural gas for grain drying. And then the next was nitrogen fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer is very energy intense. And so it's really, really important to think about how much fertilizer you're using. The next thing was our field work, our field operations, our tractors, all the things that are using fuel. That was about 14% of the, the demand right there. But one of the other projects that we've been working on simultaneous to analyzing some of our, our field crops and some of the things we're doing there is renewable fuels and fertilizer. So we have a ammonia production system that's capable of making anhydrous ammonia from wind energy. Well, that can also serve as a fossil fuel or a replacement for fossil fuels. And so we took this early LCA work of where the energy was being consumed and looked at how we could replace it with anhydrous ammonia fertilizer. And so in our base case production with, uh, with our um, corn system, we were using about two megajoules per bushel of, I think that's supposed to be kilograms, my apologies, two megajoules per kilogram of uh, fossil energy. But as we started to look at replacements, we tested out replacing with uh, replacing the diesel fuel, replacing the drying fuel, replacing the uh, renewable nitrogen fertil with renewable nitrogen fertilizer, and then looked at the combination of these. And you can see that if we start to think about this, we can reduce about 86% of all the greenhouse gas, well, sorry, 86% of the fossil energy and a pretty significant portion of greenhouse gases because fossil energy has a, has a fairly high impact for greenhouse gases. So those are co a couple of examples of how LCA is being used in agriculture and why it's such a powerful technique because it can really look at at comparing systems. So you can check method A with method B to figure out what is going to improve your system. But I do wanna kind of hit on a couple of realities. Um, the first one is documentation and data for your particular system or your particular um, meeting your particular goal can sometimes be scarce. That's why a lot of the effort in these is actually in the data collection side. The next thing is LCA is really a snapshot of a production system. You know, as I showed in the alfalfa example, data can vary quite a bit by location. 
but it also, you have to think about the timeline here. Some of the studies I've seen from the early 2000s are so out of date that they really aren't applicable anymore. So time is an issue. Um, the other thing is the uh, issues sur surrounding um, some of the biology and biological components of an agricultural system, they're complex. And so the modeling there can get kind of tough, especially on the, the soil side. So that's something to think about. Um, one of the other things is that typically we don't see too many LCAs that are fully done to ISO standards. And that, that really includes the farm sector. And it's because of additional requirements and the fact that agriculture is complex and it's hard to meet some of the standards for those, for those um, ISO standards or EU standards for other sectors. Um, specifically, you very rarely see a full study that's uh, cradle to gate or that isn't cradle to gate. Um, most of the time, a full life cycle assessment is just beyond the scope of what people can do. It takes a lot of effort to go from, you know, the, the production of fossil fuels all the way to, um, you know, recycling of, say, um, food waste. That's, that's a pretty big lift. The other thing is typically you don't see too many studies with third party reviews. Um, so that is something to think about. Um, one of the other topics I want to touch on last because it's something that um, people tend to want to do a lot and that's compare between LCA studies. Like I said, LCA studies are a snapshot in time generally. And so you need to be kind of careful. Um, one of the big points here is that LCA standards are sort of aspirational goals. Um, just because we have standards doesn't mean that every LCA is going to be the same. And so I don't recommend comparing between studies. Uh, yeah, the, for example, when I said alfalfa has pretty low environmental impacts, I didn't just directly compare my study to one other study. I looked at uh, a report that had the results from 15 different corn studies. And then I looked at all the alfalfa references I could find. And in general, that's a correct assessment. Relatively speaking, the LCA for alfalfa showed a lower carbon footprint than the LCA for corn. But I wouldn't want to directly compare um, two different studies because the results would use different background information and assumptions. Um, so that said, it's usually pretty sound to compare results from the same study. Um, so kind of quickly moving on. So I'll just tell you right now, you could spend like two or three days talking about LCA methodology and how this is all done. So I'm giving the briefest 15 minute interview I can. Um, and I'm totally willing to talk to people later about it. Um, but one last thing I did wanna cover here is that there are a lot of LCA projects or models out there, some of which are very uh, easy for people to access and try out. Others are not so easy and would probably require somebody with some training and some skills. But uh, a couple of ones that I know about that are, are more user-based, um, one is the SWINE web-based calculator by the National Pork Board. And I don't have the current address of, where it is on the website. They actually moved it a few months back, I think. Um, but that is actually a, a pretty simple to use, straightforward system. The results might not be very specific to a given farm, but it's something that people can kind of begin to explore the issue with. Um, the, the integrated farm system model from the USDA is another uh, model that's specific to one enterprise, and that's dairy. That also is kind of farmer based. There are some broader models out there. Field print is one that I haven't really explored myself, but that's from uh, Field to Market. Um, and you can find that online. Greet, I have used a few times, and that's really specific to ethanol energy and then some of the ag issues that go into ethanol specifically, corn production, uh, soybean production, 
Uh, it looks at diesel fuel as well. Another one that's a little bit more complex, but is still user friendly is uh, Comet. The Comet Farm model is uh, developed by the USDA in Colorado State. And actually is a really, has really good background um, computing going into it. It's done online, so you can use a supercomputer at Colorado, but that one is a little tougher to use. It is still relatively user-friendly, but still you want to spend some time learning about that one. And then there's all the private databases and other models. So yeah, USLCI is from the National Renewable Energy Lab. EcoInvent um, is a database. It's primarily European, but it's a very large database. So it has lots of information. Um, but it is kind of complex to use. You'd have to have some specialized training there. Um, but I think the biggest thing that all of these systems need really is data. And just as I kind of close out here, that's why one of the first things I'm putting on here as an acknowledgement is my collaborators who've provided data and the producers who I've worked with who provide data, because these are data-driven systems. And without that data, without good data, they just don't work. Um, so uh, here are some other sponsors that have worked with us and done some of the um, fundraising to help us get uh, some of these projects off the ground. And um, with that, I'm just going to leave my uh, contact information up here for a second. But I, I kind of want to add one last comment, and that is, if you're thinking about um, doing an LCA for a company or a business, or you're personally in, interested in it, um, there is a lot of information out there on the web um, to help you get a little bit of an introduction. But I would say before you uh, invest a lot of money or time into the process of an LCA, you really want to spend some time doing background research to make sure that uh, whatever question you want to ask is properly set up so that an, any LCA effort you do will help you answer that question properly. So I think with that, um, it's my time to hand it over, and I hope I didn't take up too much of uh, Jason's time. Um, but yeah, next up is Jason. Thanks for that, Joel. Appreciate it. It's a really good overview of what an LCA is and some great examples of LCAs in action, particularly in the ag space. What I'd like to do is take the next five minutes and just walk you through a project uh, of AURIs that focused on um, LCAs and sustainability messaging downstream of the agricultural process and how to effectively and uh, consider all of those things that, that go into uh, publicly, publicly communicating sustainability messaging. So with that, as you're all probably aware, the animal protein industry, and more specifically beef, has taken a bit of a consumer perception beating as a plant-based foods have used an argument that traditional animal protein has a bigger environmental impact and is thus less sustainable than plant-based proteins. Historically, from a promotional point of view, the beef industry has had success focusing on nutrient superiority while decreasing the environmental impact of the industry, all this being done in the background. As a result, consumers have not necessarily recognized the environmental gains of the industry and have seen plant-based foods take command of that sustainability messaging. So in this research funded by the Beef Checkoff, AURI and our partner Packaging Technology and Research focused on comparing the consumer perception of sustainability for seven different ground beef packaging options versus the environmental impact as measured by a life cycle analysis that was associated with each of those seven different packaging options. The goal was to strengthen the beef value proposition by visibly reinforcing its environmental gains through a change in package format that told this story and making sure that that story was backed up by the hard data of an LCA. Our key takeaway from this research was that the consumer perception of sustainability doesn't always reflect the reality or the hard numbers of a life cycle analysis. 
So to come to this conclusion, we evaluated seven packaging formats, both quantitatively via LCA and qualitatively, with consumers telling us their perceptions of each package's impact on the environment. You can see those results outlined on the graph that you see on the screen. And just to briefly describe what this graph is telling us, along the horizontal axis, you'll see the consumer sustainability perception um, from left to right, where on the left, you'll see a, a negative or low perception of sustainability. And on the right, you'll see positive or high perception of sustainability as told to us by consumers for these specific packages. Along the vertical axis, you'll see the environmental impact as measured via LCA. At the bottom of that axis is the high environmental impact or a more negative environmental impact versus the top, which has a lower impact or a, a more positive impact environmentally for those specific packages. So we broke this, this graph into four quadrants with the sweet spot in the upper right-hand corner. That being where a package could show both low LCA impact via the hard numbers in the analysis, as well as a high sustainability perception by consumers. These package formats ranged from the current most common format of an expanded polystyrene or styrofoam tray that was overwrapped in plastic film, what you would typically see on a grocery store shelf today, to a chub with a paper plastic overwrap combo that had a, a resealability feature, to a recyclable or compostable paper tray with a plastic overwrap as well as an, a resealability feature, and others as you can see here. What we found is that the current ground beef expanded polystyrene or styrofoam package had the lowest perception of sustainability, which was not a surprise to us. But the actual LCA showed that it had a top three lowest environmental impact within this comparative set. So in other words, what the consumer perceived to be an unsustainable package design actually had a lower environmental impact than other formats that were perceived to be significantly better for the environment. So the key takeaway here, the summary of what, what this research has told us, is that when a business or a brand communicates the impact of a product, process, or package publicly, sustainability as a message must be considered holistically with factors including both the public perception as well as the hard data via an LCA to deliver an authentic and validated message to the consumer that they can trust. So with that, I will turn it back to Dan and uh, you can take us off to the next part of our show. All right, uh, thanks Jason. And thank you, Joel, for uh, fighting through your under the weather as well as uh, providing a, a good overview of what life cycle assessment looks like. But next, I want to have a short discussion with Carrie Pearson and uh, Kate Berry. Carrie joined Cargill in May of 2022 as the Global Product Sustainability Lead. Now, in this role, Carrie is developing strategy and building capabilities related to product sustainability, specifically related to life cycle assessment and product environmental footprint. Carrie has worked in this space for almost 15 years, and her experience ranges from uh, working with product development teams to design uh, with uh, sustainability in mind, quantifying environmental impact of products through life cycle assessment to communication of product impacts and environmental marketing claims. Now, Kate Berry is the Sustainable Packaging Manager at Chainalytics, rooted in conservation driven by design, focusing on sustainable package development for the last 10 plus years, with focus on materials, processes, and the associated environmental impacts throughout the entire supply chain leveraging tools like life cycle analysis to deliver sustainable strategies for all sectors of the industry. Chainalytics, an NTT data company, accelerates fact-based transformation for supply chain leaders around the world. So Carrie, let's begin with some opening comments or statements about what you want to share with us today. Thanks, Dan. It's been very nice to be here today. Thanks for, for inviting me. Um, as, as Dan said, I'm, I'm with Cargill and I'm leading our global product sustainability organization. 
um, working on building on our capabilities around life cycle assessment. I did spend about 15 years in a much more manufacturing heavy um, sector doing life cycle assessments and really the nitty gritty details. And so I can, I can vouch for everything Joel said, and there are some complicating factors when you move from um, industrial systems to agricultural systems and some of the challenges for LCA. I am excited about our capabilities that we're building internally. His Cargill historically um, worked in mostly with consultants to do a lot of this work, and we're really focusing on bringing um, upskilling ourselves internally so that we can look at life cycle assessment for more products and and start communicating more about our environmental impact. So I look forward to the discussion today. And I don't know, Kate, if you want to introduce yourself and in opening remarks. Yes. Thanks again for letting me be here today. Uh, Kate Berry with Chainalytics. And I spent the last 10 years diving into package development, life cycle analysis, and how to really develop packaging and supply chains for the least environmental impact. And I can't echo what Joel said about, enough about the data is king in the situation and really understanding what outcome you're going for uh, helps drive decisions. Well, let me just uh, keep you two on the screen for a little bit and and, and uh, throw a couple questions at you. We're getting some great questions, by the way, in the Q&A. We've gotten some comments, uh, some opinions. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Carrie, uh, what's the value to the company? I guess, what, what do you, uh, in your strategic plan, when you talk about LCA, what's the value? I think it really depends on your business. So within cargo, we play in a lot of different areas. We work both in agricultural commodities to finished food products. Um, and also we have a bio-industrial space. And I, I would say, depending on which of those three areas you're talking about, the values is very different. With our food customers, we're starting to see them set um, goals for greenhouse gas reduction. And a lot of those involve reductions in their supply chain. And they really want, to, our customers really want to know what is the impact of the products and ingredients that we're buying. And so we're seeing increasing requests for that kind of data about the products that we make. And um, so I, I, there's a huge value to partnering with customers there. And then in our bio-industrial space, I would say this is the area Cargill, we have historically done the most life cycle assessment. When you're talking about taking agricultural commodities and crops and turning in them into replacements for fossil-based chemistries. Um, sustainability and life cycle assessment really is the entire value proposition for what you're doing. So a customer is not going to make the change from a petroleum-based chemical to a bio-based material unless there's some environmental impact and change for that. And being able to really have the data to back up our conclusions, I've seen some comments about cradle to gate to cradle to grave and really understanding um, what that environmental impact is and being able to tell that whole story is critical to, to getting customers interested in, in buying these materials. Kate, uh, your perspective on, on the why. Yeah, I would agree with that entirely. I would say that the value really comes from when you um, input and you understand what your baseline is and what changes you're going to make and how that's going to impact the bottom line, right? So um, if it's material change, if it's water usage, what is it that you're really looking to make that improvement? Um, and that's for the life cycle analysis. So, so as you, Kate, as you work on a, a particular life cycle analysis, are you accepting others, LCAs that are a piece of the val of the value chain or the LCA chain? Yeah. So sometimes there is other LCAs that are, um, you know, let's say from the producer of the grain, and then sometimes there's. Um, LCA from the bag manufacturer, and I'll take those and I'll compile those together. And other times it's starting completely from scratch and digging into all that data and saying, okay, how much of this question are we trying to answer um, today? And, you know, is that going to give us what we need to know? And Carrie, is that how Cargill approaches LCA as well? I think it's a mix a little bit. I, there's, there's people like Joel that are focused entirely on research on what is the impact of the agricultural commodity and the crops that we're buying. And, and we work with thousands of farmer partners across the country and across the globe, getting down to the level of detail to collect specific farm level information for every single farm that we gather crop from. Um, that's a really complicated Factor. So we use a lot of average data that's provided by universities and in some of those other databases that, that Joel mentioned, but we also, um, for our own operations, really dig in deep and get our, our process level information and then work with our customers to understand 
what are the emissions associated with using our products as well? So it's, it's a little bit of a mix. I've got a couple more questions for each of you, and then and then I think we'll bring Joel and Jason back on and answer some of those that are in our Q&A portal today. But uh, Carrie, um, how do you know that you're using somebody else's LCA and it's accurate? <laughs> um, I think a lot of times, and, and Joel hinted on this a little bit too, I think understanding the quality of the data um, comes really down to, did they do an ISO compliance study? Have they gone through that critical review process and had somebody else look at the information and say that, yes, we have followed the standard, we've collected the right level of detail of data, um, and then still putting a careful eye on it, because sometimes you'll get to the end of a study and something doesn't seem quite right. So there's a lot of time we spend, too, on sensitivity analysis, and, and what if, if there's something that's a a very significant impact to the footprint of our product. How significant is it? And if we change that value, how much how much of an impact does that have? So really understanding that. And if we don't, if we we learn that something has an impact and we don't aren't confident in the data quality, then we can go back and work with our suppliers or our partners and um, work on getting better data. I think, um, and Kate mentioned that kind of hinted at this too. I, my motto with life cycle assessment is garbage in equals garbage out. So if you don't have good quality data to start with, the results that you're going to get are not going to be that meaningful. So that data quality piece is critical. Kate, how do you gauge the quality? Very similar. You know, you have to go back with a fine tooth comb and really understand what was put in. How did they get to that metric? And then say, does that really make sense in this whole system and how they're trying to analyze it? And Typically, I spend time going back through and really understanding where exactly did that piece of data come from and how is it potentially skewing results. Uh, Kate, uh, last go around before we bring Joel and, and Jason back in, but uh, tell either the business or the consumer something they need to know about this, I guess. Uh, what do you want them to know? It's a tool. It's not a silver bullet solution for what's your environmental impact. Um, and again, it really matters the data that you put in and under, being able to understand and interpret what you're actually getting out and how that's going to impact. Carrie, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that summed it up perfectly. Well, I'll ask uh, Jason and Joel to uh, uh, come online with us again if they're able. And uh, and maybe we'll just go to the uh, Q&A portal. You can put your questions in there and we'll pick those off uh, one at a time. As I said, there were some comments in there. There were some opinions uh, stated and we just kind of set those aside for now. But I'll uh, leave these open to anybody who wants to jump in. Are there any theoretical row cropping models that would lead to a net negative carbon emission, meaning more sequestration to plant absorption than emissions? Anybody want to try that one? I think we're kind of hesitant on that one because <laughs> uh, the truth is I, I haven't seen one that says it's possible. I suspect there are some some possibilities for doing that, but it would be tough. It would have to involve some technologies like I was talking about where you're using um, ammonia as a fuel or something like that because it just it takes too many resources to make those uh, uh, net carbon. Um, if you just use standard agronomics, you really have to push the technology hard to make it uh, carbon negative. I'm going to ask Carrie, well, I'm going to ask all of you to comment on what you have heard from the other panelists today. Is there, uh, and Joel, since your mic is on, uh, anything that you heard that you uh, agree with, disagree with, uh, would like more uh, a follow up on? Well, I'll, I'll kind of be. Honest, I have partially been paying attention and partially been trying to answer questions. But generally, I think the the agreement that uh, data is king here was probably the big thing that I, I really think is important. And you know, if somebody is interested in commissioning an LCA study, they're going to have to hand over a lot of data to whoever they want to do that study, um, whether it's their data or industry data. Jason, any anything? to add to the conversations that we've already had today? I think the only thing that I would add is, is, is really just to reemphasize, I can't remember who said it, but that LCA is a tool. It's a tool to uncover where you are today and where there might be opportunities. 
What's really challenging is how to effectively use that tool to sell things, you know, as you go further down the value chain. Because a, a, a consumer, those that are actually purchasing those things, in general, they don't really understand what the LCA means. And so, you know, I would just highlight that I think it's really important that as we start to see on packages results of, of LCAs, and we are starting to see them on consumer level packaging, that, that we really think about what that means and, and how it can be effectively communicated. Because I've seen packages that, that talk about, um, you know, equivalent kilograms of carbon dioxide. As a, as a standard consumer, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so from a com so comparisons are going to be important, um, as well as, as truly understanding how that uh, LCA was communicated. So I'm, I'm skeptical that that's going to be a real effective tool in the consumer marketplace. Um, but obviously, how to, how to effectively communicate that from a consumer point of view is going to be critical as we continue to see more and more emphasis placed on, on um, the carbon footprint or the environmental footprint of products, processes, or even, even packages as we, as we continue to move down the pipe. Kate, I see you nodding your head. Uh, sounds like something you're agreeing with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, breaking down the message from an LCA and making it translatable to consumer is very hard. But how do you do that simplistically with the data behind it is really important here. And I think spending some time thinking about how if you were the consumer and you were to receive that message of 15% less CO2, what does that really mean? Can I go somewhere and get that more information on that? Um, Harry, anything to add to that comment? I'll add one comment. I think um, I think all of us in this space, and, and probably because it's the easiest to understand, we always go straight to carbon and what's the carbon footprint of the product. And when we're talking about life cycle assessment, it's important to remember that there are other environmental impacts involved as well. And that's one of the great things about LCA is we can make sure we haven't improved our carbon footprint only to degrade water quality or to kind of shift burdens around um, and really to make sure that we're not doing that. And I think in the agricultural space, we see that a lot in LCAs. You might um, be sequestering some carbon during the crop growth, but you're also using a lot of water that maybe in a fossil-based or, or alternative, um, that doesn't, it, it's different. So you have water quality impacts and other things to consider. So my my thought is, it's it It's definitely a tool, not the tool. And um, to, to not to make sure you don't neglect the other impacts and focus only on carbon. Joel, your presentation uh, generated some early questions. So I'm gonna go back to that and, and direct some of these at you, uh, including on the corn example, was precision application of inputs considered as an LCA benefit? No, I don't have enough data on precision application versus non-precision application to really look at uh, what the difference would be. Um, and that's, again, gets back to that data issue. I can only look at things I have data for. And uh, was crop rotation benefits of alfalfa considered in the LCA calculation? Um, for alfalfa, the alfalfa LCA, I only looked at alfalfa. It's one of the challenges when you deal with um, a crop rotation system, it's really, really tough because typically you want, so one functional unit. So one ton of alfalfa is your production unit for an LCA. But in a crop rotation, you have, you know, three or four different units that are being produced. And how do you compare one ton of alfalfa to say 100 uh, pounds of grain versus 200 pounds of soybean. So rotations are very tricky and there are studies that deal with them, but I, I think that we're not quite there yet on crop rotations. That's one of the things I'd like to see advanced. Carrie, is that something that uh, Cargill is looking at? Yeah, we are starting to look into that. We have um, big programs to invest in regenerative agriculture. And, and a big part of that is that cover crop. And, and making sure that farmers are, are using cover crops, but then it really complicates the LCA and we're trying to figure out how to deal with that. So you may sequester carbon in the soil during the alfalfa rotation or we'll, we'll go corn and soy. So maybe during the corn rotation, you sequester carbon, but then during the soy rotation that changes and how do you allocate some of those benefits when you're talking about different crops and 
it gets really complicated. And I don't think um, there's not a clear answer right now as to how to handle that quantitatively. And for me, the whole LCA, there's just seems to be a lot of moving pieces uh, and what to include, what not to include. Uh, am I getting it wrong? Am I overthinking it? Uh, or it, am I right? <laughs> I'll jump in. You're sure. definitely right. And I think that's when you talk about, you asked about data quality, and I think making sure that people have considered the aspects of the international standards on life cycle assessment to understand that they've included all, there's so many assumptions that go into doing a life cycle assessment, making sure they're documented, that it's transparent, that I've, I've seen some questions on allocation. If we chose a specific way to allocate our emissions, making sure that it's transparent so people understand the study and people are going to use these to make comparisons, making sure that they understand that they're comparing the right thing, I think is really important. It's, it's comp it gets complicated. Kate, is there a day coming when we're going to uncomplicate it? Um, I think if you're looking for particular level le levers to pull and, you know, one specific thing that you're going after and not a holistic system, uh, potentially, yes, but until that comes, it's going to be a gamut of information that you have to sift through. Joel, do you concur? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's complicated and it's going to remain complicated at least for a while. Uh, maybe to your earlier point, uh, until we, as we gather d more data, will it become less complicated? I think that will help, but you also have to remember when you're dealing with biology and things like that, it just stays complicated. Um, you know, we don't have enough information, like one of the questions that um, I think I answered already, but dealt with disease pressures and insect pressures and how that affects an LCA effort. Well, that's incredibly complex because if you only have disease being a factor one out of every five years or something like that, it's very hard to model um, an LCA based on something like that. So we just don't have the kind of information for very complex systems. That's why we focus on single row crops very often. I'm going to go around the table here. Does anyone expect federal mandates on carbon emissions or other emissions? Uh, Joel, let's start with you. I think there are going to be some mandates maybe on areas like tractor efficiency, maybe things like that. But I don't think that they would be able to really enforce things at the farm level. What I could also see happening is packaging. Um, you'd have to say on your package what your carbon footprint is or what your water footprint is. That would be happen sooner, I would say, than actual working at the farm level. Kate, do you see uh, federal mandates coming? I see them coming in five to 10 years, potentially. I think we're a long ways away from actually being able to control it at the farm level, like Joel said. Carrie, what's Cargill okay. thinking? Um, I think in other industries, we're already starting to see some of that where um, life cycle assessment data is being incentivized. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, there's incentives for products that have lower footprint and environmental product declaration data available. I think the food space is a little bit behind that. I think it's coming. If you look at Europe and some of the global trends, um, I think, what we will probably see regulation around first is making sure that the data, if we're making claims on our packages, that we have a proper LCA in place to support them to, to make sure that consumers aren't being misled by any of these statements. Jason, does AURI see federal mandates coming or do you personally? Well, I think based on what Carrie just said, I can't speak authoritatively about um, you know what's happening in the agriculture world. I'll leave that to, to Joel. But from a, from a consumer point of view and from a federal policy point of view, what I could see coming is, is I wouldn't, won't call it a mandate as much as I would call it uh, the need to communicate, uh, the need for brands to communicate their footprint effectively as, as new communication starts to leak out from things like the, the revamping of the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is which is happening this year, I could see some recommendations coming out of that that are, let's say that are confounded 
by a, a desire to drop the overall footprint that get leaked into the dietary guidelines for Americans. It's, it's, a, uh, it's my opinion. It's not necessarily something we've seen, but as those types of, of as that information continues to get more and more, um, let's say foundational beyond just nutrition, I could certainly see some element of of uh, sustainability leak into uh, the recommendations that come out of, of that kind of, of work. A uh, question for the larger group, and Kerry, we'll start with you. Uh, part of the industry hesitation is the cost for MRV. As the large corporations look to incentivize practice change in their supply chains in order to uh, meet the SBTI commitments. Uh, can we look at the mass balance approaches or regional LCAs versus cradle to grave to individual fields? This person knows more about it than I do, that's for sure. <laughs> that is a loaded <laughs> question. Um, I think we're spending a lot of time on MRV and it, it, getting that verification that we understand the emissions at the, the field level and are doing our LCA correctly. I. There's a huge, that, that's a loaded question. I don't know that I have a, <laughs> that's the wrong person to start with. I don't know that I understood the question, but Kate, <laughs> uh, do you want to attack that one? Uh, I really think it goes back to transparency, just understanding what questions you're asking, what you're trying to, to pull out of it and how the LCA can potentially help. And it's a broad answer, but that transparency is key. How about you, Joel? Um, well, I'll be honest, I don't deal with MRV, at least not that I know of anyway. Um, so I really can't help out too much there. Well, then I'm going to go around the table one last time and uh, let each of our guests leave our uh, participants with something that they want to have them take away from today's discussion. And Joel, what do you want to leave them with when we talk about LCAs? Um, well, I think the biggest thing is that LCAs are fairly complex. Um, as Kate was saying, we try and simplify them when we work with people and explain some of the results, but they are really the best tool we have for what we want to do in changing our environmental outcomes. And so we need to push forward in making them better and making them more applicable to more systems. Kate, final comments. Final comments. Um, it's an important tool to understand what your environmental impact is, but it's not the key component, right? So a lot of that is interpretation and understanding what other parts of the system, the water, um, that are going to impact later results, essentially. Harry? I think based on all of the discussion, I'll say communication and transparency are important, making sure that the assumptions that you've made in this complicated process are clear so that people um, use the data in a, the correct way and, and trying to simplify the results and outcomes as much as possible. And Jason, anything you want to leave them with? I'll leave it, I'll leave it like this. Joel had said earlier on that, that LCAs are a tool to understand your impact today and, and an opportunity to help you identify where you can find improvements. But just keep in mind those those improvements as we look downstream, those improvements, for instance, let's say a lower LCA package, that could mean a lower barrier to protect the food that's actually inside, which could then also lead to a lower shelf life on those food products, which could then lead to more food waste. So my point is that the complexity of calculating an LCA is absolutely 100% valid. But the trade-offs discussion is, is something that also needs to be considered as you move yourself down the value chain to truly understand the impact of any changes made as a result of understanding your, your footprint. And I think we'll leave it there today. I want to thank everyone for great presentations and participating in today's Fields of Innovation. A recording of this entire conversation will be available at auri.org. That does conclude AURI Connect's Fields of Innovation for today, presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. Please join AURI on the Fields of Innovation Facebook group for future postings of events and interesting content. And thank you for participating today. 
We hope you'll join us in March for part three of this series, where we will be exploring how agricultural value chain participants can lower their carbon intensity scores from production to processing. Thank you.